Chapter 6, The Constitution of Medina Despite the conversion to Islam of many inhabitants of Medina and after Muhammad's arrival, Muslims were still a minority in the city. A year after the Hijrah, the migration, the total Muslim population was no more than 1,500 people. In addition to this, the immigrants from Mecca and their helpers, the natives of Medina, were from different tribes and their different tribal customs led to some tension among the Muslims. The dominant group within the city, in number as well as pol uh, political and military powers, were the Jewish tribes. It was to be expected as they had some resentments about the new authority welded by Muhammad. And there remained a sizable number of pagans who had not accepted the message of Muhammad. Thus Medina was a divided city, the two chief Arab factions and the Jewish allies were at war with each other. Indeed, this was one of the main reasons Muhammad had been invited to the city to reconcile the murderous indifferences between the tribes of Medina. I will stop there. He saw his main task as forming a united community out of these heterogeneous elements. Muhammad went out of his way to cultivate good relationships with the Jewish tribes. He visited their chiefs and nobles, he fasted with them, and like them he turned his face towards Jerusalem during prayer. Eventually he persuaded the Jews and some pagan tribes to freely enter into alliance with the mutual corporations of the Muslims. The result was the formation of a new political community forged from the different groups of Medina, Muslim, Jews, Christians and the pagans. With the consent of all groups, Muhammad endowed the city with a written constitution. The constitution of Medina is the earliest and the most important document from the time of Muhammad. A number of versions of this constitution have survived, along with some letters of Muhammad. Although commonly referred to as the constitution of Medina, in the original Arabic it was simply called Kitab, or book. The constitution of Medina is not a constitution in the modern sense, more a social contract, an agreement between different groups to work and function as a unified community. The document dictated by Muhammad defines the relationship between the members of three groups. The Muhajirun or the immigrant Quraysh who had come from Mecca. The Ansar or the native helpers. And the Medinans who converted to Islam. And the Jews, I was called helpers, the Medinans who were converted to Islam then saw the same thing and the Jewish tribes of Medina it provides an overall legal framework for the social and political conduct of the community the constitution of Medina used the language and formulae of the customary law and legal practice of Medina on issues such as blood money or compensation to express the rights and responsibilities of the citizens a unified document some scholars however suggest it's a collection of documents it consists of two clearly defined parts. The first referred to the Muhajirun and the Ansar, the migrants and the native helpers, while the second addressed the Jews of Medina. There's a subsection here. The Constitution of Medina, Article 25. The Jews of Banu Auf shall be considered as a community, Ummah, along with the believers. The Jews have their religion and the Muslims have their religion. This applies to the allies and the ori orig original members of the tribe. But whosoever shall be guilty of oppressions or violate the treaty shall put to trouble none but his own person and the members of his house. The constitution begins with what looks like a declaration of independence. The second clause states, They constitute one ummah to the exclusion of all other people. They refer to Muslims, Jews and other client tribes. Together, they assert the autonomy of the newly formed community. Henceforth, they accord themselves a political identity comparable to and distinguish from that of the pagan Meccans, as well as the nearby empire of Byzantium and Persia. Their ten clauses devoted to what we would call social insurance the ransoming of captives, the payment of compensation and general welfare, 
The believers shall have none of their members in destitutions without giving him in kindness what he needs by way of ransom and blood money. The constitution recognises that people do not exist in a vacuum. Therefore, it acknowledges the existence of traditions, customs and pre-existing agreements and arrangements of the tribes in Medina and declares that they will keep to their tribal organisations and leadership, continuing to cooperate with each other in accordance with their former mutual aid, aid agreements regarding blood money and related matters. But it abolishes unjust practices such as the customary ways of private justice, tribal vengeance and excessive remunerations. A Muslim will not kill a Muslim in retaliation, nor will he demand an excessive sum of blood money or desire of gift for of injustice, sin, transgression or evil among the Muslims. They shall all unite against him, even if he is a son of one of them. There is no tribal responsibility and hence no need for collective vengeance. For the act of an individual, each is solely responsible for his own actions. He who offends, offends only against himself. And charity and goodness are clearly distinguished from crime and injury. And there is no responsibility except for one's own deeds. The administration of justice now becomes the concern of the central organisation of the community of citizens. The citizens. This is a new section, by the way. The constitution also gave due recognition to freedom of religion, particularly for the Jews, to whom it gives equal rights in all matters as citizens of Medina. The Jews have their religion and the Muslims have theirs. And any Jew who follows us is entitled to our assistance. And the same right as anyone else, as any one of us, sorry, without injustice or partnership or partisanship. Both enjoy security of their own populace and clients except the unjust and criminals amongst them. Incumbent upon the Jews is their expenditure and upon the Muslims their own. And they will aid each other against whomsoever is at war with the people of this treaty. Therefore, differences in race and language are abolished. All are equal before the law of Medina and have equal rights. The members of all groups within the community are asked to help each other and cooperate and seek sincere advice and counsel from each other. There are also clauses relating to the de defence of the city and what, one, and what we might call a foreign policy. Ultimately, Medina is declared a sanctuary for the parties to this covenant. The constitution also establishes Muhammad as a leader of the community and the chief arbitrator of disputes among groups. And whatever you defer, whatever you defer about should be brought before Allah and Muhammad. All the Jewish clans who participated in the agreements are mentioned by name. There are some disputes as to whether this include all the Jews in Medina. The prevailing theory is that the document include all the inhabitants of Medina, and this is certainly the view of Muslims and many Western scholars. However, Contemporary Jewish scholars point out that the name of the three main Jewish clans of Medina, Nadir, Gureza, and Kainuka, are not mentioned in the document. Although we do know that soon afterwards, Muhammad concluded three uh, similar treaties with them, this apparent omission has been used to suggest that not all the Jews of Medina were party to the agreement. The counter-argument is that the document mentioned by name only the independent Jewish tribes and not those that had client status. Those with client status are mentioned in general terms. Some tribes are closely identified with each other and hence are not specially named. There are also a number of unspecified pagan tribes not specially mentioned in the document. But that doesn't mean they were excluded. They're described as Tabia, as in Tabi and Tabi in followers, or had become a client of another tribe. Collectively, the Muslim Jews and pagans of Medina now constitute a single political community, with Muhammad as its leader. The document describes this as a new community as Ummah, a word that has come 
to mean a global religious community composed exclusively of Muslims. But the constitution of Medina was not a religious agreement. Not all the parties to the agreement had embraced Islam. They recognised the political authority of Muhammad under democracy and accepted him as a community leader. But many, as the document makers were clear, were Jews and pagans. This ummah was a community of common interest pursuing what they all recognised as a common good. The original signif significance of the term ummah was a multi-religious, one could even say multicultural community committed to defending its joint interests. Here's a subsection here. Muhammad and his early followers, sorry the believers, Muhammad and his early followers thought of themselves above all as being a community of believers rather than one of Muslim. They referred to themselves as believers. Some of the early believers were Christians and Jews as well, although surely not all were. The reasons for this confessionally open or ecumenical qualities is simply that the basic idea of believers and their instances on observing strict piety were in no way antithetical to beliefs and practices of some of the Christians and Jews. This is from um, what's called Fred M. Donner. Donner or Donner? Donner. I want a Donner, actually. Muhammad and the Believers. Harvard University Press, 2010, pages 58 and pages 69. Muhammad now acknowledged to be a preeminent position, more powerful than the Jews and Christians of Medina. This was a serious cause for concern to the Jewish tribes. When a leading rabbi, Abdullah ibn Salam, converted to Islam, the Jews started a verbal campaign against Muhammad and the Muslims. They tried to divide the migrants and the helpers. A number of rabbis and notables of the Jewish community tested the prophet of the faith of Abraham and tried to persuade him to move out of Medina and go to Jerusalem. Some Jews converted to Islam with the intention of sub subverting the faith from the inside. Muhammad tried to bring the three monotheistic faiths of the city together by organising a conference for Christian Jews and Muslims. Arguments were presented about the merits of the three faiths, but not surprisingly, no conclusions were reached. The Christians, however, agreed not to oppose Muhammad. Despite the constitution of Medina, the city was not entirely at peace with itself. A revelation asked Muhammad to turn his face towards Mecca rather than Jerusalem during the prayer. Many a time we have seen you, Prophet, turn your face towards heaven, so we are turning you towards a prayer direction that pleases you. Turn your face in the direction of the sacred mosque. Whatever you believers may be, turn your face towards it. Chapter 2, verse 144. This did not please the Jewish clan. In the meantime, Muhammad's erstwhile enemies, erstwhile enemies in Mecca were fully aware of what was happening in Medina. The challenge Muhammad represented to their gods and pagan beliefs and with it their vested interest in the riches. Hang on, let me turn the page. Okay. They gained from their old ways, was acquiring a new impetus, no longer constrained by the pressures of their opposition and persecution. Muhammad was liberated to advance the belief and practices of the monotheistic faith. There had already been there already been several skirmishes between the Muslims and the Quraysh from Mecca. They were now ready to launch a full-scale assault on Medina.